Okay, so let's continue where we left. Um, the last two minutes of last lecture were spent on writing the statement of this problem, which is 7.2.5. So if you don't remember, it's related to marginal productivity of capital and labor. You're given a function of the output of a factory, which is Q, and it depends into quantities, which are K and L. K, if you remember, is the capital expenditure in units of $1,000. L is the size of the labor force, which is measured in worker hours. You're given this particular form, which we have studied before as being something called the top Douglas model. The main feature of this model, if you remember, you have a constant and these two in terms of powers, with the condition that the powers, when you add them, they give you one, which is satisfied in this case. So the first statement is to find the marginal productivity of capital which is the partial derivative of Q with respect to K, and also the marginal productivity of labor, which is Q with respect to L, partial Q with respect to L, when the capital expenditure is $7,750,000, and level of labor is 991 worker hours. So we start by writing this. Is there a question? Do you guys remember this problem? Yeah, right. In the units that we're given, K is 750, L is 991. Then what you do, given this function, is that you compute the partial derivatives. This is the whole purpose of this exercise, right? So, I think that you can see this over here. First is the partial derivative with respect to K. So, L would be treated as a constant, and K is the variable, so you have 0.4 times k to the 4, 0.4 minus 1, usual power law, and L is a constant from the perspective of k. So if you want to write it actually, um, well, basically this would be 20, and then L to the 0.6, and then k to minus 0.6. Right? So I just did the addition for the powers. Then Q with respect to L as a function of these two, again the same rule. Now, when you take the partial derivative with respect to L, K is the constant, so the first two terms are regarded as constants in a way. And then you use the power law, so you have 0.6 times L to the 0.6 minus 1. Then you do this multiplication, which gives you 30. Then you have K to the 0.4 and L is to minus 0.4. So actually, this might let us express it in a simple way. Now, what we were gonna do is basically plug in these two values. So, partial of Q with respect to K, evaluating at 750, and L equal to 991. If I look at the first formula, basically 20. Then if you think about it, the L is in the numerator what you would have is actually an expression of this point. 0 0.6, 991, and then this is with a minus power, so you have 750. Is it clear? I'm just playing with the powers. If I do this in the calculator, I get something of the 0 0.23, 0 0.64. But for the other one, I can do exactly the same. That's why I spent my time expressing this in a hopefully nice fashion. So evaluating at the same point, now you have 30, then you have a quotient to the power 0.4, K is 750, and then 991 in the denominator. And all these to the power 0.4. You do the computation, multiply by 30, this is 26.84. So in terms of the commandment of the exercise, we're done, right? So the second is basically a comparison. Of course, it's uh, with very idealized conditions and under some assumptions, which is the following statement. And you will see why I'm making this observation. So the question number B is should the manufacturer consider adding capital or increasing 
the labor level to increase the output. I mean, of course, there is an assumption, which is that increasing each of the variables by one has the same cost, in a way. That is an assumption of the model. But essentially, they just want you to translate the problem into comparing the two partial derivatives and to see in which direction you have the bigger increase. That's the whole purpose. So in terms of the mathematical purpose, not the economics, because that would involve more knowledge of the problem. We'll just give the answer, which is, well, the observation is that to increase in one unit of capital, which in terms of the units is basically $1,000, that results in an output increase of 23.64, if you look at the first computation. So you only increase K and L is fixed, which is less than the 26.84 unit increase in the output, resulting from the unit increase in the labor level. So you basically, well, again, remembering that the marginal is by definition the unit increase, which is of course related to the derivative when the delta in the variable, like for example, delta k would be one. Well, that would be the resulting. So basically these are the comparison of the derivatives in two directions, right? You are in a KL plane, you go in this direction, jumping one unit, you see how much the function increases. And in the other direction, you do the same. So of course, this value is bigger than the other. So in terms of the units, basically in this direction you go faster. Of course there are some considerations, if you were actually a business person, what costs more, increasing one unit of labor or one unit of capital? That is behind. But that is some assumption that this is not an economics or a business class. Just for the sake of the math, it's clear which value is bigger. So in this case you would go from 991 to 992 worker hours, which is increase of one in the L. And well, yeah, to increase the output as quickly as possible. So basically, like in terms of the math, they just want you to value it in which you have a plane, you have two directions, you have a function of two variables, you have to evaluate the direction of increase in each direction, keeping one of the variables fixed, and then you go into one line, then the other, which one is bigger, which is the whole comparison. This value is bigger than this one, so the growth is faster along this direction, of course, where you have made a choice of the units. Perhaps if you make a change in the units, the values will change. That's basically a change of variables where you will ha have a factor in the delta x, so of course that will have a consequence. But for the sake of the chosen units, the change in the function would be bigger along the direction of L. So, okay, that is the whole purpose of that example, which we have finished. And since we are familiar now with partial derivatives, there is actually the same way, well, in the 1D case, if you remember, you go from first derivative to second derivatives because especially when you try to find the maximum and the minimum, usually finding the second derivative is a good criteria. For similar reasons, but in general, just to study the concept of the second order partial derivative, we will make that study. And let's jump now to second order partial derivative. So, the idea is that, let's say that you have a function of two variables, set equal to f of x and y. So remember the notation. We have two notations for the partial derivatives. The subindex indicates in which direction you're taking the partial derivative. You have the, the in the, uh, well, partial set with respect to x or fx. Just keep it in mind. So now what I'm gonna write is the partial derivative 
f sub x with respect to x is by notation, well, you apply the partial derivative with respect to x to f sub x, so you have two indexes. Of course, the notation is trying to explain you, right? So you have the function, which in this case is the one obtained from the first partial derivative, and then you apply a second partial derivative. That's why you have a double index. There is an alternate notation, which is, well, this delta, or partial symbol, squared, just as in the case of uh, 1d, but with the delta instead of the, the d, which is also trying to explain that you apply twice this operator, right? So basically you have the first partial derivative, fx and partial set with respect to x is the same, and you apply it again, okay? And the two stands for the fact that you apply that operator two times. Now, um, you will jump into the partial derivative of f sub x with respect to y, and this is where keeping the order might be important at the beginning. Later on we'll prove a theorem which will be helpful, but for the moment, think about it. Let's say that you have f of x, y. What they're telling you is that you're taking the partial derivative of this function with respect to y. So formally speaking, what is happening is that you have the function f sub x, and you take the partial derivative of this function, which is f sub x, with respect to y. So the order is indicating basically which operator you apply first. First you apply the derivative with respect to x, then the derivative with respect to y. That's the notation. Then if you go into the other notation, what you would have is second derivative of set, well, partial, then dy dx, precisely because the order in which they appear in the notation indicates, indicates which operator is being applied first. So if you think about it, first you have the partial of set with respect to x. You do that computation, which is equivalent to f sub x. Then after that, you apply the partial derivative with respect to y. So in this case, the order is different because it's nested in a different way, okay? But it's meaning the same thing. You have the function, which is f sub x. In this case, it's partial set with respect to x. First, you apply the derivative with respect to x, then you apply the derivative with respect to y, likewise in the same way. So, um, there is another so-called mixed partial derivative, which is, so the partial derivative of f sub y with respect to x is, and again, the function is f sub y, then apply, I apply partial derivative with respect to x, which by the notation in the order is f y x, right? Again, first partial with respect to y, then partial with respect to x. Or, well, second derivative, dx dy, again, because in the order of the operators, first you apply the partial of set with respect to y, and then with respect to x, okay? So, in each notation, the order in which they appear there, it's indicating you what one you apply first, okay? So, there will be a theorem which we will see, or state in one second, which will be helpful, especially for this two. Um, but before we do that, I'll just introduce a notation of the partial derivative of f sub y with respect is there a question? Do you guys have a question in the back? Okay. So it's f y y, which means that you have f sub y, and then you apply the partial with respect to y, or in this notation you have basically the operator, the operator partial with respect to y applied twice, right? That's why you have this notation. So this notation is actually quite similar to functions of one variable. It might be easier for you to get used to it. This one perhaps takes some time, but it's also useful. It really depends on the application where they show up. I would recommend you to get familiar with both so that you do not get lost in the notation. Um, in principle, this would be different, but we will just state a theorem in which actually under center and certain conditions they are the same. That is 
basically the whole thing. For most of the functions that you will do in this course, where you have some continuity functions, etc., uh, continuity assumptions, you these two will be the same, like uh, f x y and f y x. So let's do an example first, which again is related to the computation, computing, second order. partial derivatives and the statement of the problem is to compute the four second order partial derivatives of the function of two variables f of x y equal to x y cubed plus 5xy squared plus 2x plus 1, okay? So, so far, so good. Having introduced you to the notation, the idea is precisely to learn to do the computation. So first we compute f sub x. So, well, basically this would be y cubed and then plus 5y squared plus 2, right? Because, well, we have linear functions of x. So in terms of when you take the partial derivative under with respect to x, the y is a constant, and that's why you get this. Now, if you think about it, after you compute partial with respect to x, f sub x is only a function of y. So if you compute the second derivative with respect to x, well, nothing depends on x anymore. So since we're regarding this kind of computations y as a constant, when we take a partial with respect to x, this will be zero. That is clear, right? Yeah, you guys are familiar with what am I doing? You guys remember the rules? When I take partial with respect to x, the y is regarded as a constant, which is what is happening here. That's why the second derivative is here. Okay, let's continue and hopefully it will become clear. Look, let me write f x y, which means, okay, first I apply partial with respect to x, which is what I obtained, and then I will compute the partial of this stuff with respect to y. So this would be 3y squared plus 10y, this is a constant. And well, now what I will do is to compute partial of f with respect to y, right? So I go back to this object, here. So, well, the x is the constant, so you have 3xy squared, then you have 10xy, then this doesn't depend on y, so it doesn't appear. Let's compute the second derivative with respect to y, fyy, right? So this would be 6xy plus 10x, right? So you have 2y times 3x, 6xy, then this would be the constant, which is a companion, and if I compute now f y sub x, which means first I compute partial with respect to y, then partial with respect to x, well, then you have 3y squared plus 10y. Now, notice this, right? It's kind of funny that in this case, for this function, fxy is equal to fyx. In this one, first I compute the partial with respect to x and then the partial with respect to y. In this other one, I first compute the partial with respect to y and then the partial with respect to x. They are the same, it's actually not a coincidence. Um, if you make enough continuity assumptions for these functions, you will have that criteria. So that is a condition for the mixed partial derivative. Um, this is not a proof-oriented course, so we'll just make the statement of the condition, which happens for most functions which are well-behaved. Polynomials are a case in which that happens. So the mental note to make is that f x y and f y x, well, both of them have a name, and they are called mixed second order partial derivatives of f. And the name is self-explanatory in the sense that second order because you have vital derivatives and they're mixed because it involves x and y. 
It doesn't involve like purely X or purely Y. And the point is that under certain conditions, which are usually satisfied by the functions you will encounter in this course, or in practical work, especially if you deal with polynomials. They are equal. So most of the times what you have is that fyx is equal to fx. There are some conditions, of course, you can find cases in which they are not equal. Usually they relate the quasi-duality, but in general, they will be the same especially for simple functions like, like polynomials. So, well, what we will do now is uh, present a couple of problems where the second order partial derivatives are important. Um, again, they are on the applied side. Um, something that if you want to think about it, and that might pop up later on, for example, in this uh, output function, right, which depends on the capital investment and the labor force. That is a function of two variables. At the same time, um, let's say that you want to make a study of that problem over time, in which you make k and l depend on time. So you have a function of two variables, but each one of those two variables depends on time. That kind of makes sense, because everything involves in time, right? So for that, what you will have is later on a chain rule, which lets you put the dependence of the output function on time, since k and l would depend on time in that case, then q would depend on time, and there's a way to evaluate the dependence of time ultimately by a chain rule. So that we will see later. Um, but it's interesting because this kind of stuff actually could appear in the modeling, uh, in your discipline. So, first we will do an example to get some interpretation of the partial derivative. So, which is n point to point A. So, we'll then interpret the second order partial derivative. And, well, instead of writing the statement, I will just write again this function, right? And I will explain that later. So, Q is basically an output the factory, L is the size of the labor force in the units of worker hours, and K is the amount of capital invested in the plant. So at this point, we're pretty familiar with the model because so far we have seen always this dependence. And the question is to give an economic interpretation of the sign of the second derivative of Q with respect to L, right? So if you remember, here, only the L variable is involved in the sense that when you compute the first partial derivative and the second partial derivative, the K is the variable constant and L is the variable, right? So, the solution in terms of the signs, that will be basically the way we will start. So, if you have partial second derivative of Q with respect to L less than zero, Again, basically what we're saying is that the marginal productivity, if you remember how we define the marginal productivity of labor, so this is just the partial of Q with respect to L. Well, you guys remember this definition, right? The marginal is just the first derivative, and then with respect to which variable is the QDL. That is just a constant. If this happens, Thinking about this as a function, I mean this is partial with respect to L of dq over dl. So this would be the function. And what you're observing is that whatever this function, it is a decreasing function of L. So this decreases 
that's early to improve. Right. Yeah. Think about it just basically in terms of functions of one D, of one variable, right? Second derivative is just the derivative of the first derivative. So thinking of this as a function is just a liquidity function. That's just what it is. Um, of course, we're assuming that k is fixed in this computation of the partial derivative. So for fixed k, the effect on the output of one additional worker hour Basically, again, um, when you do the partials, you keep one of the variables fixed and you increase the other one. In this case, we increase L, which is related to the worker hours, and because of the units, it's a unit increase. That labor is greater when the workforce is small. And when it's large. It's just basically saying that this is a decreasing function. It's just that. Nothing else. Um, the other possibility, of course, is let's say that you have a different sign, right? So second derivative of Q with respect to L greater than zero. Basically, partial of Q with respect to L increases with L. Because again, this is the partial with respect to L of dQ of dL. So this is, considering this as a function, this is just an increasing function. Um, there is one condition. So, well, I mean, you guys have understood at this point that basically one of the variables is fixed in the, when you compute the pure partials, which is k in this case, because I'm computing only partials with respect to L. Um, because it's increasing, basically, the effect is partial with, of Q with respect to L, because that's the way you measure the effect when you make a change in L, is greater as you increase L. That is understood. So there is one last um, piece of information that typically for a factory operating with an adequate workforce, Usually the condition second derivative of Q with respect to L less than zero holds. I'm not a business person. I have some intuition from the math point of view of why this happens. But actually I must say that I personally do not know the answer. So this is an economics and business question. So actually I'm curious if somebody would like to contribute on why this happens in a normal factory. Does anybody know? I mean, for me, I just would like to make a hand wavy. I'm not sure if it's true or not, but looking as a math person about this, the first thing I would say, well, let's say, think of the case where basically L is extremely big, where one more worker doesn't make a difference. I wouldn't observe a big difference in the output, right? Which would be different in the case when the labor workforce is small. But that's just like my math uh, way of thinking, just thinking basically as workers uh, the same way as I think of particles. But, okay, uh, if you're curious, look at the answer in your courses. Uh, that's not something we'll study. We'll actually go for what I was mentioning before, which is the chain rule for partial derivatives. So we have finished the exercise. And again, think about it. Let's say even for this kind of model, right? We have a function of a variable. However, let's say that I want to think about the time evolution of this, of the output, of the capital, of the labor force. That would happen in terms of time. And so, what happens if I want to think of k depending on time, l depending on time, and therefore because q depends on k and l, q would depend on time too. So I would like to study the time evolution of all these quantities. So, giving that interpretation, we will write the following. Suppose, said is a function of x and y, each of which is a function 
Sometimes T can be interpreted as a time. It doesn't need to happen all the time, but if you want to get familiar with it, it's useful. So then set can be regarded as a function of T. And so before I write the formula, which is the chain rule, basically what we're having is that Z depends on X and Y, but X depends on time, or T, and Y depends on T, right? So what you would have is, formally speaking, that Z depends on time on this way, right? Um, yeah, you can think of many possible interpretations. Using the time would be useful. Essentially, what I would like to do is to compute, well, let's say that Z is now in the real numbers. And via the dependence of X and Y in time, if I consider Z as a function of time, this is again a function of one variable into one variable. So if I want to consider how Z depends on time via the derivative, I would use the chain rule, which is, well, Formally speaking, set depends on x and y. So I know that this has a partial derivative with respect to x, but this would be multiplied by dx dt. Then I consider the dependence on set with respect to y, knowing that y depends on time. So if I want to basically study the whole dependence via the derivative of set with respect to time, this chain rule would give me the information of how set increases as t increases. Okay. Have you guys seen this? Well, um, no. this you have not seen before. It's kind of intuitive because of the way we have used the chain rule in one view. Um, actually, well, I don't want to write more notation so that you can you get more confused. So maybe it's more convenient to make more interpretations. But this actually is related to something called the gradient. And then if you interpret t as time, and let's say for example x and y as positions of a particle, what you have is the gradient multiplied by a velocity. So this chain rule is intuitive. Um, on the other hand, well, what we're doing is basically adding two increments. The first one is the rate of change of z with respect to t when y is fixed. Right? That's why you have the partial with respect to x. The second is the rate of change of z with respect to t for fixed x. Because you're computing a partial with respect to y, where you keep x fixed or constant, and then you consider the increment. It's actually very intuitive from the point of view, right? Because again, thinking of this derivative or partial as some deltas, like an approximation of this quotient of increases, what you're doing is saying, well, okay, how much does Z changes when I change time? Well, Z can change because the change in X, but the change in X is related to the change in time. And then Z can change because of Y too, but that change in Y might be related to a change in time. So what you're doing is to adding those two. From that point of view, it's pretty intuitive what you're doing. Um, what we will do now is to perform a couple examples where we use this chain rule. And the first one will be exercise 7.2.9, which is related to using the chain rule to compute a demand rate. So again, we're in this kind of problems where we have a lot of information, so bear with me. What you have is basically a store, a health store. With two brands of vitamin water. A and B. Now, we're going to define some variables. So, brand A 
is sold for X dollars per bottle and the brand B is sold for Y dollars per bottle. So again, we're just defining the variable. And then we have certain knowledge that in this case, defining this variable, the demand for brand A will be given by a function Q of X and Y, 300 minus 20 X squared plus 30 Y, and the units are bottles per month. And we also have basic evolution of X and Y in terms of time, or saying that T months from now, the price of the brand A will be X equal to 2 plus 0 0.05 T dollars per bottle and price of brand B will be which is Y by definition 2 plus 0.1 square root of T and again dollars per bottle since those were the units we used so again the problem fits the characteristic that we have mentioned before. You have a function of two variables, and but those two variables depend on a third one, which is a scalar, which is t. In this case, we can interpret it as the time, which is measured in months. And the question is, at what rate should we expect the demand for brand A changing with respect to time four months from now. So this is asking you to compute the chain rule and evaluating at t equal to four given the definition of the variables. And the second question is uh, just uh, asking if the demand is increasing or decreasing. So, again, the solution, well, just to state the goal, and I'm gonna introduce some notation that might not be in the book, but I think it's quite explanatory. So the goal is to find the derivative of Q with respect to time evaluated at T equal to four. The time, well, if you think about it, T is months from now. They're asking you at the time four months, so this is something that you may have not seen. Where Q depends on X, with, uh, depends on time, and Y also depends on time via the two formulas that you were given, right? So now we're gonna use our chain rule formula. So, derivative of Q with respect to time, first partial of Q with respect to X times DX over dt plus partial of q with respect to y times dy over dt. So far so good? Everybody comfortable? Okay. So now we just have to do the computations. Um, yeah, where did I write this? Yeah. So we have this formula. This only depends on x, this only depends on y, so not mixed. So what you have is minus 4tx and then you have the x dt, so the dependence is linear, so the only thing that you have is 0 0.05, then partial of q with respect to y, this is 30, and then partial of y with respect to t, this is the dependence, so what you have is 0.1, and then t to the 1 half, so you will have a factor of 2, then t to minus 1 half, right? So I'm using the formula for the square root, and adding this constant. So one half t minus one half. Um, perhaps I can express it in a nicer fashion. 
So if I do the multiplication, I would have the basically minus two times x. Then I can do this. Well, this is 15 times 0.1, so plus 1.5t uh, to the minus one half. So I just do the multiplication of these two, keep it working. Um, the last part, of course, is evaluating, right? So for t equal to four, if you do the evaluation, x to four is equal to two plus 0 0.05 times four. So it would be 2.2. And then the reason we did this is because in this formula, only x is appearing on time. There is no y, so we don't need to do the computation of y at four for the moment. And in that case, if I want to compute the partial of q with respect to time, I put time t equal to four, so this is where I'm using this notation. I have minus two times x at four, which is 2.2, .2, then plus 1.5. If you want, I can put the t in the denominator. So this would be the square root of four. So minus 4.4 plus 1.5 divided by two, if you do the computation, well, this would be 0.75, and then you do the addition, this would be minus 3.65. Um, so, well, this is with a minus sign, so of course the function is decreasing. And basically the last piece of information is to write that four months from now, which is for t equal to four, the demand for the brand A will be a decreasing function because of the sign at a rate of 3.65 bubbles per month. Of course, we're indicating it's decreasing, which is taking care of this sign that's over here. But, I mean, the scenario is quite reasonable, regardless of the practical application that we're considering right now especially since you guys are business students. If you have the Q in terms of the K and the L, of course, if I want to see the actual change in thing, it would make sense to study the time evolution. So some of the quantities that I might encounter, I might make functions of time. In this case, of course, the information was given so that I could know how X and Y change uh, with respect to time. So that you would need to figure out in your own job, but the scenario is quite possible. So what we're going to do now is just a little approximation or some intuition to understand how this chamber works, which is what I was saying in hand wavy terms, which is, well, basically, let's think of the incremental approximation formula. or functions of today. So suppose you have a function set of two variables x and y, and if delta x denotes a small change in x, and delta y, a small change in y, then delta z is approximately, delta z approximately partial of z with respect to x times delta x plus partial of z with respect to y times delta y. Of course, this is basically the discrete version of what we wrote in terms of the chain formula. In fact, we're using the chain formula, okay? The second observation is, this is approximate. In the limit, they are equal. When you do an actual increase, they're not exactly the same. But the approximation is useful, because usually, especially think about it. If you work with polynomials, to evaluate exactly that difference, you would have to do the polynomial computation twice and take the difference. If you compute the derivative, first of all, you lower the polynomials by one degree. So if you do some computations, hopefully they will be easier. And it will amount to basically computation and division. 
So the idea is that in general, we're simple cases for functions of two variables, the computational cost will be smaller, uh, or at least the function would be easier to handle than making that solution. Again, we should state that this is a linear approximation. This is a linear approximation because usually when you evaluate at a point, these two coefficients are constant. So what you're doing is basically account the total change. Well, you're following basically x and y, then the change due to the time, and then to evaluate in this curve, doing the change in x and y, then how it changes in z. But still the approximation is linear in the sense that it's working uh, as a plane. So hopefully this gives more intuition in terms of the chain rule interpretation where you have a function of two variables. And the last example will be precisely to study incremental approximation in one of the business problems. So if you consider exercise 9.2.10, which is incremental approximation of the output, the statement of the problem is the following. The daily output at the factory is Q equal to 60 times K to the one half L to the one third units. So before we continue, is this um, kind of like a Cobb Douglas model? No, right, because the powers do not add to one, right? So it's a model, we were given to it, of course we're happy to do computations, but it doesn't satisfy exactly the assumptions that we knew before where the sum of the powers gives you one. So K is the capital investment, and the whole reason we're mentioning this again is because we indicate the units, which are measured in $1,000. And L is the size of the labor force in terms of worker hours. So the information is that the current capital investment is $900,000, which in the units means that K is equal to 900. And then you also have the piece of information that 1,000 worker hours of labor are used each day. So L is equal to 1,000, or 1,000 worker hours. And so we have to estimate the change in the output that will result if the capital investment is increased by $1,000, meaning a unit of one, and the labor is increased by two worker hours, which are two units. So again, in the statement, just to remind you, K is equal to 900, L is equal to 1,000, delta K is equal to Y because of the units of choice. And here we're measuring things in $1,000, and delta L is equal to two. So now we use the chain rule for now. Delta Q equal to partial of Q with respect to K times delta K plus partial of Q with respect to L delta L. So this is basically the chain rule, but in the discrete approximation. Um, so we have to compute based on this function, right? So, so far so good? Okay. So if I do the computation based on this formula, you have basically 60 over two K minus one half L one third delta K plus 60 and then over three K to the one half L to the minus two thirds delta L. So just remember the formula that was above. Then you would have 30 times, well, this is 10 to the cube to the one third divided by 30 squared to the one half times one plus 20 times 
30 squared to the one half divided by 10 cubed to the two thirds times two. Then this is equal to 30 times 10 divided by 30 plus 20 times 30 over 100 times two, which gives you 10 plus 12, which is 22. So that would be the answer. So, well, best of luck from your exam tomorrow. Uh, see you at either 6.45 or the other hour. Good, how about you? Good, good. Um